Welcome to Fantasy Cartography, the show where we see what maps can teach us about fantasy and what fantasy can teach us about maps. On today's episode, I'm going to try and explain why European-derived culture is the world leader today, but using actual science instead of racism. This is an episode where I need to drop quite a few warnings before I can actually get going, because, you know, white guy. Caveat the first, I need to define the word civilization here. I'm going to aim for a really broad definition to include not only the full spectrum of Earth civilizations, but also a wide variety of possible imaginary ones. So here's my definition for this video. Civilization is what happens when a culture is able to organize itself beyond a day's walking distance. This definition should include most agricultural societies from Earth history and even some hunter-gatherer societies. By this definition, most of the world today could be considered as one big civilization, but I don't really have a problem with that. Caveat the second. A lot of the stuff that I'm using today comes from the works of Jared Diamond, especially his book Guns, Germs and Steel. Now, not every anthropologist in the world appreciates Diamond and his ideas are far from uncontroversial. But I'm using his ideas today because, firstly, I happen to agree with them, and secondly, they're very easy to apply to fantasy maps. My third and final caveat is here to hopefully stave off some accusations of Eurocentric racism. See, I believe that European-derived civilization basically rules the world today. I live in Australia, but my ancestors are from Scotland, and I'm speaking a European-derived language which can be understood by a majority of the world's population. But just because European-derived culture does rule the world, doesn't actually mean that it should. There is nothing physically, mentally or morally superior about white people. The reason that European culture rules the world today is because our distant ancestors got lucky. The geography of Europe provided more opportunities to my ancestors than the geography of Australia did for the Aboriginal people that my ancestors displaced. If the world was different, things would have gone differently. So with those caveats out of the way, we can actually talk about the way that civilizations grow and spread. While humans are an inherently social species, we still need reasons to organize ourselves beyond the tribal level. And a lot of those reasons depend on geography. Some geographic features make it easier for civilizations to start and spread, others make it harder. There are three loose rules that we can use to break this down. The first rule is that civilizations need food. One of the biggest things that brings humans together into organized communities is the need for a consistent food supply. In most cases, this means agriculture, but agriculture is dependent on the available local plants and animals and how susceptible they are to domestication. This is why the Australian Aboriginals never really developed an agricultural society. There aren't many native grain plants in Australia and the native mammals are almost all marsupials, which are slow to breed and mature and thus aren't great for domestication. At most, the Aboriginals would plant edible seeds like macadamia nuts, leave the plants to their own devices, and return later to harvest them. So while the Aboriginal societies did have enough organisation to be called a civilization under my earlier definition, they never really had enough of a stable food supply to move beyond Stone Age technology. The reason we associate agriculture with the development of civilizations is because the stable food supply of agriculture supports a higher birth rate and higher population density, and grains and farmed meats can be stored over time. That means that agriculture can be used to support class structures, kings, priests, bureaucrats, soldiers and other specialists. That in turn can lead to the development of kingdoms and empires. Which brings me to the next rule. How do these civilizations spread after they're established? Well, because developed civilizations are mostly associated with agriculture, civilizations are incredibly sensitive to climate, and that means that they prefer to spread east and west. As a very general rule, the climate of a continent won't change very much as you move east-west, but will change more substantially as you move north-south. That's probably the biggest factor that gave Eurasia a huge advantage in terms of agricultural development. Eurasia is a lot wider east-west than it is north-south, 
So once agriculture developed in the Middle East and China, it was relatively easy to spread those seeds, animals and farming techniques across the continent. By contrast, it took a long time for the Mississippian civilization of eastern North America to domesticate the crops that we today think of as American. A lot of their staples, like maize and potatoes, originated further south and had to adapt to more temperate climates. The Mississippians would probably have loved having llamas for meat and burden, but to get the llamas there you'd have to walk them across the deserts of Texas. Because of climatic variation, the east-west axis of Europe meant that it was much easier for the farmers of the Middle East to drive cows across Europe than it was to drive llamas across the north-south axis of America. The third rule of civilization jumps us ahead a little bit, to the point where civilizations are sufficiently organized to be called kingdoms or empires. They have a large sedentary population, and their main defining feature is technological development. The third rule, then, is that technological development is mostly driven by competition. There's a general and slightly racist perception in Western society that Europe went through continuous technological development, while Eastern Asia had more of a stepped progression, alternating between development and stagnation. And while that's often used to justify anti-Asian views, there is a vague grain of truth to it, and once again, it comes down to a contrast in geography. A lot of East Asia consists of large flat areas of land interspersed with slow rivers and calm oceans for easy transport. That means that it was fairly easy to establish unified kingdoms like China, Japan and Korea. Depending on where you count it from, China has existed as a relatively stable political entity for three or four thousand years. Technologically speaking, that meant that there was little need to develop new wartime technologies. Peaceful technologies like writing and the magnetic compass spread quickly throughout East Asia, but things like gunpowder went through more of a boom-bust cycle. Europe, on the other hand, is geographically fractured by mountains and unsteady rivers and inland seas, meaning that the history of Europe has a lot more by the way of wars between small kingdoms. And those wars led to aggressive pushes to develop better weapons. The Chinese invented gunpowder, but it was Europeans who ran with it and built guns as we understand them today. Most pre-industrial revolution technological developments that we enjoy today were a side benefit of squabbles between European kingdoms. When it comes to fantasy world building, most of these rules for how civilizations spread come under the heading of interesting to think about rather than absolutely central. If you're interested in using this stuff as the hub of a fantasy story, then I definitely recommend that you read Guns, Germs and Steel for yourself. But it's worth applying these rules to some fantasy maps by way of a thought exercise. In the Belgariad, for example, these rules aren't applied very strongly. The semi-unified kingdoms of the west are clustered around the western coast of the continent, while the Angraks on the eastern coast are also semi-unified under the theocratic rule of Torak and the Grolims. This doesn't gel with the rules of civilization from earlier. The continent where the story takes place has a north-south axis, and the two main civilizations both stretch all the way from the equator to the Arctic Circle. To some extent this is excusable because most of the civilizations in this world are explicitly the chosen peoples of different gods, but while David and Lee Eddings did do an excellent job of characterizing each civilization, this map doesn't really explain how agriculture actually came to spread across the continent. You can make an interesting contrast here with A Song of Ice and Fire. In this series, the continent of Westeros is a single, mostly unified empire, roughly analogous to England or France in the Middle Ages, while the continent of Essos is divided between coastal city-states with enormously varying cultures. Applying the rules of civilization literally, this doesn't make a lot of sense. We would expect the flat grasslands of Essos to provide fertile grounds for a unified civilization like China, while mountainous Westeros would be broken into many smaller kingdoms with difficulty establishing consistent agriculture. But this is actually an example of how fantasy lets you break and bend the rules of the real world, because the seasons in A Song of Ice and Fire don't work properly. Summers and winters can last for years at a time, because magic. And that means that it would be much easier to push agriculture northwards or southwards than it is on Earth. There's a lot more climatic consistency. And Westeros also follows the third rule pretty literally. 
Westeros seems to have been technologically stagnant for a few thousand years, while the city-states of Essos, being locked in competition with each other and the roving hordes of the Dothraki, appear to be working with more Renaissance-level technology, although nobody has invented gunpowder yet. I don't know whether or not George R. R. Martin has ever read Guns, Gems and Steel, but his books do certainly play with its ideas in an interesting way. I'm reminded of some good advice that I've heard many times. The reason we have rules is so you can think before you break them. That's it for this episode of Fantasy Cartography. Please stay until after the credits for the unrelated interesting fact of the day. Please subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon and give this video a thumbs up if you learned anything. The full script is available on fantasycartography.tumblr.com. You can ask me questions with the Tumblr Ask box or by using Facebook, Twitter or Interpretive Dance. Questions or corrections can be emailed to fantasycartography at iinet.net.au. I had to trim a lot of stuff out of this script, so I've got plenty more facts to go around. Until next time, may your fantasy be cartographic, and your cartography be fantastic. <laughs>